All right, this is it. We are at the final part, the final 102 Looney Tunes cartoons. So, does it get as bad as everyone else says? And if it does, is there perhaps a diamond in the rough that maybe tends to get overlooked? Well, there's only one way to find out. And before we get started, as always, a quick thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. Special shout out to my newest patron, The Great Luigi. Thank you for your support. And if you enjoy the content I make and would like to offer your support, for as little as a dollar a month, you can get your name listed right here at the start of every video. Link to that is in the description below. And, as always, if you've missed any of my previous videos in the series, the links to parts 1 through 9 are in the description below. But, I know you're as anxious to get into this as I am, so let's just dive right in. Bill of Hair Despite parts of this feeling so lethargic, especially the opening bit where it genuinely feels like they're just going through the motions to get to the meat of the cartoon, this is a solid, if unimpressive, Bugs vs. Taz outing. Nothing in this feels particularly original, which, yeah, is to be expected by this point. Zoom at the top. This one's got some great bits, like this rocket gag and this glue boomerang joke, in which the anticipation of what's coming builds and builds and builds. I also especially enjoy this bit where gravity negatively affects the coyote, but not the roadrunner. And the coyote kind of just takes a minute to reflect on how that doesn't make any kind of sense. Not one of the truly excellent Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons, but an enjoyable one nonetheless. The Slick Chick. Congratulations, Bob McKimson. You managed to accomplish something that I didn't even know was possible. You actually managed to come up with a rival for Foghorn that is like a thousand times more annoying than Henry Hawk. I am not exaggerating when I say Junior is a terrible terrible character he's not funny and his whole soft-spoken sadism demeanor is just man it does not work maybe this cartoon had a chance of working if foghorn actually deserves the torment he's put through but he really doesn't here or if he was at the very least able to get revenge on him but no the cartoon just stops once it reaches the six minute mark louve come back to me with Pepe Le Pew's final outing, it's interesting that they actually added something of a love triangle angle to this one. With Penelope actually having a proper boyfriend in Claude Cat before Pepe comes along. And Claude challenges Pepe to a duel. Now, more could have been done with this concept because as is, it doesn't amount to a ton. But it does show that there was still potential within these cartoons. Anyway, the thing that elevates this one is the gags related to the works of art reacting to Pepe's stench, particularly the Venus de Milo gag. Honey's Money. This one kind of takes the setups of Hair Trimmed and His Bitter Half and kind of throws the two of them in a blender. For what it is, it's fine, although if they were going to have a Yosemite Sam cartoon without bugs, I kind of expected them to do something a little bit more original than this. But even still, the interactions between Sam and Wentworth are actually funny and go a long way in making this one worth watching in spite of its lack of originality. The Jet Cage Good grief, what is wrong with Tweety's voice in this one? And I know I've already harped on this before and I will continue to do so as these cartoons go on, but the animation is just getting so stiff, which obviously is going to hurt the timing of the slapstick gags, which you know, are the things that tend to make or break these Sylvester and Tweety cartoons. And it also doesn't really take the time for the gags to sink in. Like this gag where Sylvester explodes. It doesn't really leave a beat for you to actually take in what happened. Instead, just fading to black and moving on to the next gag. And the ending gag feels like the start of a punchline rather than a fully thought out joke. Mother was a rooster. This one features Barnyard Dog at his most pointlessly cruel and features foghorn at his most bizarrely heartwarming curiously for as cruel and cynical as looney tunes can be at times it is weird that anytime parenthood is unexpectedly thrust on these characters they almost always choose to accept the challenge without question or complaint the ostrich is a cute little guy and the gags while stuff we've seen before are done decently good stuff good news a late daffy duck outing 
wherein his characterization is neither like his original screw-up personality, nor his later greedy jerk persona, but is instead closer to Bugs Bunny's personality. Best thing I can say about this one is that it's not really unpleasant to sit through, but there's nothing particularly noteworthy about it either. Even the image of seeing Daffy Duck being hung by a noose has absolutely no weight to it, so it can't even elicit some laughs just from the sheer cruelty of it. Shishkabugs. This is yet another one where the passion in this one is just missing. The entire thing feels like it's on autopilot. A plot that's been done before. Absolutely no unique spin or gags in the entire thing. A lethargic pace. Like, I'm not kidding, the pacing in this one almost put me to sleep. Everything about this one is predictable, and feels like a cartoon that, in the 50s, they would have rejected for being too dull and generic. Martian Through Georgia. Give it this. This one features some typical Chuck Jones abstract experimentation, which means we're getting something different compared to all the other output that we're getting at this time. This one feels more like a hodgepodge of ideas kind of crammed together rather than a coherent narrative. Like, what exactly is the point of all this? That if you're bored with your life, just go somewhere where you're despised so that you'll know just how good you actually have it? Also, they call him a Martian even though he's not from Mars. So, that's really confusing. It's not really that funny, but it's also not really trying to be funny, so... I don't know, this one just kind of feels like they didn't have much time to try to work out all the kinks in order to bring whatever vision they had for this to full fruition. But, I also appreciate the effort nonetheless. I Was a Teenage Thumb Another Chuck Jones one-shot, but this one just straight up doesn't work. Chuck Jones has usually been relatively immune from the budget cut so far, but here it seems like it's finally caught up with him. There's a lot of animation shortcuts that feel very obvious. This thing is also paced so bizarrely. Just like Martian Through Georgia, I don't even understand what this one is trying to accomplish. It's not funny, not really that creative, it kind of jumps around so erratically. Just stick with Tom Thumb in trouble. Devil's Feud Cake. Yet another clip show. But, give it this. At least it has a plot that actually enhances some of the jokes. I mean, I kind of like this idea of Sam actually getting killed by Bugs Bunny and then being thrust into hell, and the devil keeps sending Sam back to try to retrieve Bugs for him. And so when some of these slapstick jokes end with Sam going to hell, it means that Bugs actually killed Yosemite Sam, which does kind of make a couple of the slapstick moments just a hair punchier than the original. Now, granted, that still doesn't justify this being a clip show, but the premise of this one, I actually do like. Fast Buck Duck. I have to admit, this one moves at quite a chaotic pace. This one feels kind of similar to Daffy Dilly, although no obviously nowhere near as good as that excellent piece. And, yeah, this bit involving the lake really got to me. Kind of a standard ending punchline, but it's handled decently enough. The Million Hair. For those that want to see more of Daffy and Bugs being cruel to each other, this delivers just enough. This one's worth it just for the bit where Bugs wonders if Daffy will remember that he can fly, and then later will remember if he can swim. And I do quite like the ending to this one as well, even though, again, the punchline is a little bit predictable. Mexican Cat Dance This cartoon literally reuses the opening for Bully for Bugs for no real reason. The only thing that it does is make you realize just how far the animation has fallen in the last decade or so. So, you know, nice going there. And honestly, the rest of this isn't that good either. You basically have Sylvester acting like a bull. Like, literally, he moves around and acts like a bull. And Speedy acting like a matador. I... Words cannot describe just how bizarre this entire thing comes across. Also, if you want to try to hide your lack of budget, maybe put more effort in trying to make your background animation loops more conspicuous. Just saying. Now, hear this. Now, see, if the other Looney Tunes cartoons of this era were a lot more like this, I think that they could have gone out at the very least in style. But, then again, doing so might take away from what makes this one so special. This one is probably as close to purely abstract as Chuck Jones has ever gotten made up almost entirely of surreal, absurdist animation, and carefully picked, excellent sound effects. This one is one where you remember more 
how it made you feel in the moment while you're watching it, rather than any particular standout moments. And in a sea of mediocrity, this cartoon as a whole really sticks out. This is one that you don't really want to understand, you just want to experience it. And that is just A-OK -okay in my book. Woolen Underwear So, now Sam and Ralph live together? Okay, more needs to be done with this duo, and I'm not even kidding. This utterly bizarre dynamic needs to be explored some more. Anyway, this one's got some good slapstick, but as always, it's this fantastic camaraderie that carries these Ralph and Sam cartoons. And honestly, it seems fitting that this gag, where Ralph tries to throw absolutely everything at Sam, only to be stopped at the last second by the work clock, being the final gag in the cartoon. It's kind of beautifully poetic in a way. Hair Breath Hurry you know, this meta-commentary about bugs replacing the Roadrunner in a cartoon might have actually been funny if the Coyote and Bugs didn't already have a pre-established relationship from previous cartoons. This one kind of feels like they wanted to do a Roadrunner cartoon wherein the Roadrunner could actually fight back against the Coyote. I guess it's fine, but it also doesn't really feel like this trip was necessary. Banty Raids Kind of a mixture of Baby Buggy Bunny, set on a Foghorn Leghorn vs. Dog cartoon, with the horniness of an old-fashioned Frank Tashlin cartoon. Now, there's a combination I never thought I'd see. It's not outstanding by any means, although the ending gag really does make this one. Chilly Weather Honestly, Frizz Freeling's been on a slump for a while. I am not feeling even the tiniest ounce of passion in his cartoons anymore. Everything that's in here has been done before, and done better, so there's absolutely no reason to check this one out. The Unmentionables. This cartoon tries its absolute hardest to tell a good cartoon with the very limited budget that they had, and it's actually pretty okay. Granted, I haven't seen The Untouchables, so I don't know how this works as a parody, but the gags in here are good, especially the surprisingly gruesome disconnected gag and this ending punchline was actually a good one to end on. Although, admittedly, this blatant reusing of the same background for back-to-back -back shots is distracting to say the very least. Aqua Duck Daffy Duck seems to be working hard to defy Adam Smith's paradox of value. This one's not a bad idea per se, it's just not executed all that great, mainly because it's not exactly made clear to the audience whether or not the mouse is actually asking Daffy for the gold nugget in exchange for the water. But it does manage to create a rather hot and dry atmosphere, and does so rather effectively. And the entire thing is building to one big punchline that actually did elicit a chuckle out of me. So, I guess the whole thing was worth it. Mad as a Mars Hare. It's a Bugs vs. Marvin the Martian outing only without that much Bugs vs. Marvin the Martian in it. This cartoon is like 75% setup, and the buildup it ultimately leads to is kind of weak. The opening bit of the rocket flying right into Marvin is easily the best and funniest part. And when the best part of your Bugs Bunny cartoon is the only part of the cartoon that doesn't have Bugs Bunny in it, you know you've done something very wrong. Claws in the Lease this isn't one of the most structurally sound cartoons or anything like that, but it's one of the funnier ones that they've had in quite a while. I mean, okay, this isn't great, but they managed to get the timing right on a lot of this. And plus, there's just something curious about seeing Sylvester being used as a loofah by a showering naked fat woman. Also, Sylvester Jr. is always a real treat to watch. Transylvania 6 5000 Looks like Chuck Jones decided to work in one more really good Bugs Bunny outing in the classic era. This is a fun little bit of cartoon chaos. It's paced well, it's silly without being outright hilarious, and if nothing else, Chuck Jones has, like he's done so well in the past, created a nice little gothic atmosphere that makes this one a fun Halloween watch for the kiddies. To beep or not to beep? This is the one with the catapult. I really don't feel I need to elaborate. This contains one of the funniest back-to-back -back Roadrunner gags in any given cartoon. And the rest of these are pretty good too. Incredibly funny, and it's a nice comfort to know, even when the other surrounding cartoons aren't doing all that great, Chuck Jones can still produce something that is pure cartoon chaotic fun. 
I just hope Warner Brothers knows what they've got and do whatever they can to keep him employed with them. Dumb Patrol. Now, this Dumb Patrol is not to be confused with the Dumb Patrol released all the way back in 1931, starring Bosco. This is the one released in 1964 and stars Yosemite Sam and Bugs, and a cameo from Porky Pig of all people. Anyway, this is fairly standard fare, especially for this point. Passable enough slapstick without doing anything that great, and a wish they had done just a little bit more with the setup. It's alright, I guess, but only for a filler cartoon. A Message to Gracias This is a pretty good and enjoyable Sylvester and Speedy Chase cartoon for the most part. Nothing truly outstanding except for maybe this boat gag. No, what really elevates this one is the ending, where Speedy is greatly annoyed that El Supremo had him risk his life just to deliver a happy birthday message. And so, he sick Sylvester on both of them. That is just all levels of sadistic, and I love it so much. Bartholomew vs. The Wheel. This one has a very 60s art style to it, if you know what I mean. This one's not bad per se, it's just kind of bland. The story is very simplistic, and oftentimes the character development doesn't really feel like it flows organically. Like, how exactly does it track that Bartholomew being in a country without wheels suddenly makes him love wheels again? I don't know. But, I mean, for what it is, it's cute enough. Freudy Cat. Yet another clip show, this time focusing on the Hippity Hopper cartoons. I mean, I always did say that these Hippity Hopper cartoons were more or less indistinguishable from each other, so if there was a series of cartoons that was made for a clip show, it would be the Hippity Hopper cartoons. And I do kind of like this idea of Sylvester being so paranoid about coming across Hippity Hopper again that he has to go to therapy in order to cope with it. But again, yeah, this is a clip show, and I can only give so much credit to something that was clearly only made to try to save money and nothing else. Dr. Devil and Mr. Hare. And now it's time for Taz to take his bow, and he actually goes out on something of a high note. It's got its fair share of funny moments, has a theme that it sticks to, what with Bugs disguising himself as a doctor, and plus, I actually like how Bugs is actually outsmarted by the devil at one point. It shows, even at this stage, a willingness to tweak the formula and subvert expectations. There are still sparks of life to be found here. Bob McKimson can be wildly inconsistent for sure, but by golly, he is still trying. Nuts and Volts Everything about this one screams, I am doing the bare minimum work. Largely uninspired gags, poor timing, lackluster animation, and, of course, flat backgrounds. I can't really add anything to this one other than it's just not that funny or engaging. The Iceman Duckiff one of the things I've noticed about these later cartoons in particular isn't just that the animation is getting weaker and the gags are getting weaker, it's that they don't flow together with any kind of finesse. Everything just kind of happens. And this cartoon is one of the clearest examples I can think of so far of what I'm talking about. A gag will happen, and then it immediately jumps ahead without much segue, or allowing any time for the gags or events to really sink in. This is one that I wish was better than it actually was because the idea is not a bad one, but you kind of get the feeling that they didn't have the time or budget to work out all the kinks. Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, this is the cartoon where the I saw a guy do this in a toothpaste ad once clip comes from. And in case you were curious, the toothpaste ad in question was that of Colgate. War and Pieces. This is not one of the best Roadrunner cartoons. Some of the gags are... Fine, I guess, but I can't really say this one came anywhere near actually making me laugh or even chuckle. Probably the closest has to be the one with the harem, and I think the only reason that one works as well as it does is because there's just something kind of inherently funny of the idea of the coyote and the roadrunner both being horny for the exact same thing. But otherwise, the gags just don't really have the impeccable pacing that we've come to expect. And it is with this cartoon that we bid a very, very sad farewell to Chuck Jones. This was his final cartoon that he worked on and received credit for prior to his firing in 1962. Bon voyage, Mr. Jones. Your hard work definitely did not go unnoticed. Hawaiian I I. I still maintain that The Last Hungry Cat would have been the perfect finale for the Sylvester and Tweety cartoons of the classic era. But for what this one is, it's not terrible, I guess. 
I mean, this plays out kind of like your typical Sylvester and Tweety cartoon, although it would be more accurate to say that this cartoon is more about Sylvester battling against a shark, but whatever. There is absolutely nothing new or interesting about this one, nothing whatsoever to make it stand apart from the other Sylvester and Tweety cartoons, other than it being their final outing together. False Hair this cartoon marks something of an end of an era. This not only contains the final appearance of Bugs Bunny and Foghorn Leghorn, this is not only the final cartoon to use the iconic bullseye opening and closing title cards, which, for the record, no, I don't know why they stopped using it when it was as iconic as it was, but whatever. But this was also the final cartoon that was produced at the original animation studio. And so there is something kind of melancholic about this one because of that. It's almost like saying goodbye to an old friend because you remember all the fun times you had beforehand, but at the same time you also have to acknowledge that, yeah, they weren't really putting in their best work like they used to. And if nothing else, at least Bugs in the classic era went out on, okay, not necessarily a high note, but at the very least a cartoon that's actually kind of okay. I actually really do like this bit where the young wolf looks inside the casket where his uncle is, and the results of what happened to him were apparently so gruesome that he can't even bear to look at it, and we the audience don't get to see it. The rest of it is typical bug shenanigans. Nothing more, nothing less, but at least it's done competently, which at this point I am more than happy with. Senorea and the Glass Harach. And with this cartoon, this marks the actual official end of an era. Because while False Hair was the final cartoon produced at the original animation studio, this is the final one that was released, as this one had been finished all the way back in 1961. And they go out with a cartoon that honestly could have been better, but it also could have been worse. This is an attempt at retelling the story of Cinderella as a Mexican fairy tale. This isn't really a bad idea for a cartoon, and some of the ideas are actually kind of funny. Like, instead of mice into horses, it changes it to cockroaches into burrows. But the problem is that there's just not enough time to really do the story justice. The ending in particular just feels very rushed, almost like it's just trying to get it over with. And while the animation is very colorful, I also wasn't really the biggest fan of the art style. Probably the best thing about this one is the ending punchline. Which, you kind of get the feeling the whole entire thing was made just to tell this one single joke. Poncho's Hideaway and with this one, we're entering a new era of Looney Tunes. The cartoons that were made by the DePatty Freeling Enterprise Studios. And obviously, you can tell the budgets have been slashed yet again. But even still, they try their absolute best to work within their limitations and try their hardest to actually put out something halfway decent. To be completely frank, I think the novelty of seeing Speedy going up against what is very clearly supposed to be the Mexican equivalent of Yosemite Sam does some of the heavy lifting here. Although admittedly, I also do quite enjoy the pettiness of the villain getting his revenge by making Speedy have to recount all the money. This isn't great by any stretch of the imagination, but it could have been far, far worse. Road to Andalay. And so now with this one, we get another Sylvester and Speedy cartoon, and give it this, adding a killer bird into the dynamic was a novel concept, and mixes up the formula. Unfortunately, they don't do enough with it to make it worthwhile. The gags are pretty much exactly what you expect, nothing more, nothing less, and they're not executed in a fun way either. Also, at the start, Sylvester blatantly ignores the pet shop owner's warning and takes off the bird's mask, for no adequately explained reason. I get that Sylvester's supposed to be kind of dumb, but his actions still need to make some kind of sense. Zip, zip, hooray. Alright, I'm gonna have to explain this one. This technically is not considered an official Looney Tunes cartoon. And the reason for that is this cartoon is made up entirely of footage from the 1962 pilot for a television series called The Adventures of the Roadrunner which wasn't picked up. So I guess they figured, why not just recycle the footage and turn it into a theatrical cartoon? But I decided to talk about it here because, hey, when the heck else am I going to get a chance to talk about it? Now, the idea here is a pretty good one. Two young kids are sitting down and watching Roadrunner cartoons on TV, and the coyote stops to answer their question about why he's chasing after the Roadrunner. 
The pacing of this bit where the coyote explains why does go on too long, which makes sense because this was intended to be part of a 22 minute television episode, not a six minute cartoon. And not surprisingly, the ending is horribly abrupt. What makes this one, believe it or not, is the interactions between the two boys watching TV. The way they talk to each other is just a lot of fun. And some of the things they say border on meta commentary. Like when one of them says that he sometimes feels sorry for the coyote and wants him to catch the Roadrunner, but then his friend points out that if that happened, there would be no more cartoons. It's good stuff, but yeah, you can definitely tell this was made for television first. It's nice to have a mouse around the house. Alright, it appears this is where the cracks are finally starting to burst at the seams. For starters, this is the first instance of what will likely be the strangest Looney Tunes duo, and that's the Daffy vs. Speedy cartoons. Because I remember when I first saw Speedy Gonzalez, the very first thing I thought to myself is, you know who he needs to go up against? Daffy Duck. Just... why? Their personalities are not a good fit together, and this cartoon kind of shows why. And yeah, the lower budget animation is really starting to take its toll. I mean, look at this! Speedy is dragging Daffy around the house, and Daffy doesn't look like he's actually hitting anything. And the gags are so horribly telegraphed. Like this bit where Daffy puts the mouse punch card into the robot, and then as it's chasing Speedy around, you can clearly see Daffy's face on the magazine right here. Gee, I wonder where this is headed. This wouldn't even be acceptable for television, let alone for a theatrical cartoon. Cats and Bruises. Boy, they are really making their fill of Speedy Gonzalez cartoons now. It genuinely comes across like Warner Brothers knew that their time making these cartoons was coming to a close, and so they were trying to make as many speedy cartoons as possible so they could sell them to some Mexican television stations or something like that. Either that, or they had some dirt on poor Speedy and were blackmailing him into starring in these dull, repetitive, poorly timed cartoons. Every single gag in this is recycled from somewhere else. Most blatantly, this gag that's reused from Canary Row. And recycled gags, for the most part, would be forgivable if the animation and timing were on point, but if it's not on point, though, it just makes you wish that you were watching the original cartoon instead. This cartoon gives so little of a crap that at one point Sylvester tangles with a bunch of dogs, and then he manages to escape without a hair on his head being harmed. I mean, if he's not hurt, then where's the comedy? Roadrunner a go, go So, yeah, same deal with this one as in Zip Zip Hooray. But, honestly, I don't have much to say about this one. This one feels like even more of a clip show than the other one. The only moment of inspiration that I do kind of like is this idea of Wiley actually looking back at one of his past mistakes and finding out what exactly he did wrong. But it honestly doesn't amount to much. Oh, and this one starts out with what I can only assume was going to be the show's theme song. It's not very good. The Wild Chase. The most generous thing I can say about this one is that the premise is good. The idea of a race between Speedy and the Roadrunner trying to determine which one is faster is one of the more inspired ideas they've had in a while. But what does it ultimately amount to? Mostly using it as an excuse to recycle old Roadrunner gags. And even in some cases, recycle animation whole cloth. Again, there is just absolutely no sense whatsoever that anybody behind the scenes actually wanted to make this. Oh, and to add insult to injury, this ended up being the final cartoon that Frizz Freeling directed at Warner Brothers. Moby Duck. So, the big problem with this one is that this one's a remake of Canned Feud. And the direct comparison to an older, much better cartoon only makes it abundantly clear just how far the Linnetons have fallen since then. Many of the gags are completely recycled from that cartoon, only... You guessed it, the animation is a lot weaker here, so the gags just don't land. I hope that doesn't become a reoccurring trend. Assault and Peppered. This one is surprisingly actually pretty tolerable. The idea of Daffy and Speedy going to war, Yosemite vs. Bug style, actually gives way to more than a few decent jokes, like the cannonball gag and the landmine gag. The biggest distraction here is that Daffy seems a lot meaner than normal. Well-worn Daffy. Remember how I said in the last one how the biggest distraction was how Daffy was meaner than normal? Well, yeah, Daffy's worse here. A lot worse. 
Most of this cartoon is watching Daffy just deny some dying mice even the tiniest drop of water. For no reason. Like, this isn't funny. It's just sad. Suppress Duck. This kind of has that old school madcap chase formula that's been lacking in many of the Looney Tunes previous cartoons as of late. And while, yes, obviously the lower budget does it a disservice, I actually kind of enjoyed many of the gags here. Most especially when the game warden goes way over the top in trying to get Daffy to stay on his side of the line. Corn on the Cop. This one feels particularly out of place for its time era. In fact, if this had been made in the 50s, this could have easily been a Chuck Jones cartoon. Now, the setup for this one is genius, and while hints of inspiration do shine through, most especially the bit where Granny smacks the crap out of Daffy thinking that he's a trick-or-treater, the cartoon does kind of lose a little bit of steam by the end. Still though, I'll take the good when I can get it. Also, it was nice to see Porky Pig one last time before his character's retirement. Rushing Roulette. Look, am I going to try to pretend that this has the feel of Chuck Jones' work on the Roadrunner cartoons? No. But this cartoon is a prime example of, I understood the assignment. I laughed, and that's all that matters. Although, I do have to admit how bizarre it is to see them try to repurpose the those endearing young charms gag into a Roadrunner bit. Run, run, sweet Roadrunner. It's the pacing that really does this one a disservice. I think this cartoon is something like four Roadrunner gags spread over six minutes. The Roadrunner cartoons work best when they're fast moving, hitting gag after gag after gag, usually managing to stay just a second or two ahead of the audience. But when you know exactly what the punchline's gonna be a good 30 seconds before it actually happens, there is no sense of catharsis when the punchline hits. There's no sense of momentum, and the timing here is just completely off. Tease for two. So, now the Goofy Gophers are back for one last hurrah. Or rather, they're back for one last... Eh. These barely feel like the same characters, no doubt hurt by the fact that they didn't even bother to bring back Stan Freeberg to voice one of the Gophers. Instead, just having Mel Blank do both of them. And yet, Blank it seems, seemingly forgot how he voiced his own gopher, since they both sound very off here. In fact, every single thing about this just feels tired and off. Tired and Feathered I have a feeling these Roadrunner cartoons directed by Rudy Lariva are not going to be that good. The way this one is paced just doesn't feel right. Also, it's really bizarre to see so many of Chuck Jones' rules for Roadrunner cartoons being broken. The closest thing to an inspired moment here is when the coyote uses, like, an airplane backpack, and the propeller ends up chopping his tail up. That's the one time the cartoon actually manages to stay one step ahead of the audience. Boulder Wham. Okay, that title's not even creative. Anyway, this one's unique for a Roadrunner cartoon, and that it's not often you see the coyote trying to accomplish one singular goal. In this case, just get across a single gorge. And there is something kind of sadistically amusing in the idea of the Roadrunner just standing there and watching all of this unfold. Now, does this actually make it good? Eh, not really. The animation is still really cheap and doesn't really pull off the slapstick well enough to elicit a laugh. And the plot really feels like more an excuse to reuse as much animation as possible. Chili Corn Corny This one is a typical Speedy vs. Daffy cartoon, with Jose the Crow thrown into the mix. But then it takes a rather surprising turn when Daffy tries to pit the two of them against each other. Speedy refuses to take the bait, but Jose betrays him without even a second thought. And Speedy doesn't even bat an eye at the betrayal. It's not really funny, but it does create a rather unique dynamic to close the cartoon out on. So there's that. Just plain beep. Some of the gags of the coyote getting hurt aren't even in the middle of him trying to catch the Roadrunner, but rather just going about his everyday life. Like when he gets run over by the mail truck simply while waiting for the mail. That might have been insightful if I felt it was done intentionally, or if the slapstick was in any way hard hitting. This Roadrunner cartoon has pace and flow that is more likely to put you to sleep rather than invigorate you. Harried and Hurried This Roadrunner cartoon has pace and flow that is more likely to put you to sleep rather than invigorate you. Wait a second, didn't I just say that? Hey, if they're not going to put in any extra effort into these, such as blatantly recycling animation, I don't see why I need to put extra effort into critiquing them. 
Go, go, amigo. Daffy's motivation seems to decay the further into the cartoon we get, and not in a way that feels like it was done intentionally. Like, his motivation should be he wants the mice to pay for a radio, but then how exactly is he making any potential money by destroying several of his records? Anyway, the premise in and of itself isn't terrible, it's just not executed in a way that's, what's the word, good. Highway Runnery. More of the same issues that have plagued these Rudy LaVera Roadrunner cartoons. The slapstick gags just straight up don't work, and the pacing is utterly lethargic. I mean, these cartoons all fail in exactly the same way, what am I supposed to say? Chaser on the Rocks. The idea of taking advantage of its desert setting and emphasizing the coyote's thirst in addition to his hunger is not a bad idea for a twist on the formula at all. I mean, they are in the desert after all. There's only one problem. The time period in which it was made. The Astro Duck. I'm still not really on board with Daffy's characterization in these Speedy vs. Daffy cartoons. But, for what it is, this one's almost passable. The setup is very simplistic, but Speedy has some good one-liners in here. The problem, as always, is that the animation by this point is so cheap that the slapstick just does, doesn't even remotely work. Also, for some really strange reason, the title card actively spoils this cartoon's ending. Shot and bothered. Is it just me, or is the slapstick getting even worse than before? Just look at this crap. The boulder didn't squish him, it just landed beside him. That is inexcusable. And I'm almost positive that an entire minute of this cartoon is devoted to just looking at pipes. This is honestly getting really sad at this point. Out and out route. On two separate occasions, the coyote orders birds in his quest to catch the Roadrunner when instead he could have just, you know, eaten those birds. I may be thinking too hard about this, but when what's on the screen isn't grabbing you at all, you're only left alone with your thoughts. It's almost like staring into the cold abyss and have your innermost thoughts reflected back at you. And you start asking questions that you shouldn't, like, how did I get here? Why am I doing this? And will they even make one more good Looney Tunes cartoon at this point? Mucho Locos. You know what I think I was missing at this point? Another clip show. Oh, and they don't even have the courtesy to actually just use the original clips. Instead, it looks like they redrew the clips in order to match the cheaper animation style of this era. I don't know whether I should be impressed that they actually bothered to take the effort to do that, or be pissed off because they actually made good animation look worse. Seriously, what even is the point with this one? The Solid Tin Coyote. You know what's most painful about this one? This is an idea that actually had potential. There's even a shake-up to the formula in that the Roadrunner actually gets terrified by the coyote for a second. It could have actually raised the stakes and done something different. Unfortunately, the bad pacing and choppy animation once again kills this one before it even had a chance to get off the ground. Mexican Mouse Piece Daffy Duck does his best coyote impression by rounding up a bunch of Mexicans, tricking them into a wooden crate with the promise of a better life, and trying to ship them off illegally into a country where they'll be devoured by a bunch of predators. Uh, hang on a second, are you absolutely sure this wasn't intended to be a metaphor of some kind? Anyway, you gotta appreciate Bob McKimson sticking around and trying to make something work, even with the lower budget and executive demands. Granted, it has the futility of trying to bail out a sinking canoe with a single bucket, but I appreciate the effort regardless. Clippity Clobbered, the last of the Rudy Lariva directed Roadrunner cartoons. And what a surprise, just like the one that came before it, it's not very good. Cheap, choppy animation, poor slapstick, and lacking in the pacing department. Probably the most surprising thing about this one is that there are moments where things are made invisible, and yet they actually kept the outline intact, when they could have just saved time on animation by just making them completely invisible. So, I guess I'll give them a little bit of credit for that. But just a little bit. Daffy Rents. This cartoon is cheapness personified. The animation is even worse than normal. Oh, and to make matters even worse, the sound work on this one is awful too. The sound effects in this one are absolutely grating, and there's not even a second of silence, so you're constantly bombarded with noise. There is not a single inspired moment in this thing. 
A Haunting We Will Go. You know what irritates me about this one more than anything? The complete and utter pointlessness of all of it. Nothing in this happens for any real reason. Why does Speedy pop up just to be turned into Witch Hazel other than to have Speedy in this cartoon? Nothing, and I mean nothing, was gained by having him pretend to be Witch Hazel when Daffy first shows up. And why does he just go along with it? I don't know. But you know what I find more insulting than anything else? More insulting than the horrendous animation, the plot that doesn't make sense, the fact that this isn't funny, or the character's actions don't feel remotely thought out. It's that this cartoon has the gall to reuse this design of Daffy from Duck Amuck. There are jokes and gags that you are allowed to recycle in these cartoons. This is not one of those. This is what desperation looks like. Trying to remind your audience of a cartoon far, far better than this one and hope that maybe some of that cartoon's goodness and creativity will somehow rub off on this one. This is the animation equivalent of just giving up. Snow excuse. At one point, Daffy says, This is getting monotonous. I couldn't agree more. A squeak in the deep. So they set up this big boat race, and then don't even bother to give it any kind of proper resolution. I'd say that I was disappointed, but that would imply that I approached this expecting that it might be halfway decent. Feather Finger. Credit where it's due, this blown to smithereens joke is one of the more inspired jokes they've had in a long while. Oh, the execution of it's not good, but the idea for the joke is definitely solid. Other than that, this one contains more of the same problem that have plagued the previous Daffy vs. Speedy cartoons. It's honestly really hard to talk about these when they more or less fail in exactly the same way. Swing Ding Amigo. You know, normally in these Daffy vs. Speedy cartoons, Daffy is being a one-dimensional jerk who just goes way above and beyond being nasty for no real reason. Here, though, it's kind of difficult to blame him, to be honest. Anyway, you know the drill by now. Lackluster animation, a pairing that doesn't really work, blah, blah, blah. The grenade joke is decently constructed, but it would have been a lot funnier in the olden times if they'd gotten the timing just right. Sugar and Spies. The final Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoon of the classic era, and honestly, it's probably for the best that this series was put to rest. Now, is this one terrible? Not... Really? I mean, it's not good, but it's quite watchable for the most part. The mail bomb being returned due to insufficient postage was actually a good bit. And Wally using a machine gun against the Roadrunner was something I didn't know I needed in my life, but there it is. A taste of catnip. Talk about a breath of fresh air. This entire cartoon almost feels like a meta-commentary about the nature of these Daffy vs. Speedy cartoons. What with Daffy slowly going insane over wanting to chase after Speedy, even though, as he points out in the cartoon, ducks don't eat mice. And I will happily take neurotic Daffy over villainous Daffy. This is the one time where it actually feels like Daffy and Speedy belong in the same cartoon. Now, this still isn't great, but this late in the game, something this passable is almost divine. Also, this is Sylvester's final appearance. Which means out of the classic Looney Tunes cartoons, Daffy Duck and Speedy Gonzalez are it. They are in the final two. Daffy's Diner. The final of the DePatty Freeling era cartoons, and unfortunately, they did not send it out on a high note. This is just more of the same issues. Mostly bad with poor, cheap animation. With maybe one or two little instances of inspiration. Like this mousetrap gag, for instance. That would have been funny if it had been handled just a few years prior. I can't say I'm sad to see these go, but I also don't have much hope for the remaining 26 cartoons either. Oh, and they repurpose one of the ending lines from Golden Yeggs, only they have the line not make any sense here. Quacker Tracker. This was the first of three cartoons made over at Format Productions during the transition period, before the Looney Tunes cartoon started being produced over at its final resting place, Seven Arts Animation. So how is it? Well, to answer that question, here's a riddle for you. What's worse than a Speedy vs. Daffy cartoon directed by Bob McKimson? How about one directed by Rudy Lariva? 
To say that this whole entire cartoon feels off would be an understatement. The timing in this thing is completely off kilter, far more so than anything made before. It also legitimately feels like there are shots missing, as characters will just teleport wherever they're needed. Anything to limit the amount of actual animation in this cartoon. And every single gag in this is taken from somewhere else. This almost makes me want to take back every bad thing I said about the Patty Freeling. Almost. The Music Maestro. This one's a slight improvement over the previous one, keyword being slight. This is still fundamentally broken with horrendous animation, but at least this one has a plot that, under different circumstances, could have actually worked. The Spy Swatter. The last of these transition cartoons directed by Rudy Lariva. And yeah, all the same issues that plague the last two plague this one as well. The animation in this is just so lazy. Like in this shot where it looks like the background artist just gave up drawing buildings halfway through. And honestly, the plot's pretty lazy too. I mean, why does the secret society just so happen to have a camera in the lab of a mouse scientist? I know I'm overthinking this, but it's the only thing I can do to try to keep my brain from turning into mush. Speedy goes to town. And now we've entered the final stage of the Looney Tunes journey. The Seven Arts Animation Era. And while we're not off to the best of starts, at least the animation is slightly better than the last three cartoons. But everything else is just... Man, I don't even know how to describe it. The gags are all repeats from somewhere else, and this cartoon is so ill-conceived that even when Daffy is the butt of an explosion, he looks just fine. All his feathers look intact. He looks a little bit ruffled at worst. If there are no consequences to your slapstick, then it's not funny. Road into stardom. Oh look, things have gotten so lazy that now they're remaking old cartoons, even though they make absolutely no sense in context. In this case, this is a remake of A Star is Bored, only instead of Daffy being a stuntman for Bugs, he's meant to be a stuntman for Speedy Gonzalez. How does that make even the least bit of sense? They look nothing alike. They're not even close to the same size. They don't even have Daffy dress up like Speedy to try to sell the illusion. Oh, and as to be expected, the animation is just flat, lifeless, and kills any potential for the slapstick to actually work. Go Away, Stow Away. Compared to the previous two, this one is kinda, sorta competent. I mean, at least it flows comprehensibly and has some level of originality about itself. This still isn't good or funny, but at least you can sit down and watch this one without feeling like you're going insane. The standout dumb moment has to be Daffy just drawing a little white circle right on the deck and... Apparently his plan was that Speedy was just going to stand right inside that circle and stay there, despite there being no obvious reason for him to do so. Yeah, I don't get it either. Cool Cat. You know, you gotta give Alex Lovey and Seven Arts Animation some credit. I mean, they could have just done nothing but Speedy vs. Daffy cartoons and called it a day. But they actually decided to try their hand at creating some new characters. It was a risk, and even though it ultimately didn't work... I can't really fault them for trying. Cool Cat doesn't really make much of a first impression, but he's also not annoying. Maybe with a higher animation budget, this could have had a chance at working. Merlin the Magic Mouse. So now we get introduced to Merlin the Magic Mouse, a parody of W.C. Fields that feels like it's two decades out of place. The idea of an incompetent mouse magician could have actually opened itself up to some real comedic possibilities if given time to flourish. The saw gag in particular is actually decently constructed. Fiesta Fiasco. It's so bizarre to see Speedy and Daffy interact with each other as if they're longtime buddies. Anyway, the best way I can describe this one is that this cartoon is more or less the same joke repeated over and over and over again. And then on top of that, it all builds to a really predictable punchline. The only real positive thing about this one is that there is something kind of nice in seeing Speedy actually throwing Daffy a surprise birthday party. You know, kind of warms the heart a little bit, you know? Hocus Pocus Pow Wow. Some might be tempted to say this one's actually pretty racially insensitive. I would postulate that this one is far too lame to really offend anybody. This one is just so boring. Norman Normal. 
This cartoon has an interesting reputation in that it is the only Warner Brothers cartoon during this time period that was not labeled as either a Looney Tunes cartoon or a Merry Melodies. And yeah, since the topic's been brought up, I'm not entirely sure why they kept the title of Merry Melodies this late when the distinction between the two cartoon series has not been prominent since the 40s, but whatever. Anyway, this cartoon was labeled simply as a cartoon special, likely because this was the only cartoon that Seven Arts Animation made that was intended to be a one-shot. And when I say this one is nothing like the other cartoons during this time, I mean it. Not only does this one have its own theme song, but rather than the slapstick chase antics that Looney Tunes has been using as their bread and butter up to this point, this one is primarily intended to be a satire about business ethics and adult peer pressure. This one, more than any other Looney Tunes, especially around this time era, is aimed at adults rather than kids. Now, I wouldn't call this one funny, but it is rather interesting to watch. Like, the boss trying to pressure Norman into doing something that he shouldn't do is compared to two children arguing. And then there's the bit of Norman not feeling comfortable with laughing at a joke about a minority, but feeling obligated to laugh because everyone else is. Or the bartender trying to pressure Norman into drinking even though he doesn't really want to. And for once, the very limited, almost stilted animation kind of matches the dry, observational humor. Who knows, maybe if Looney Tunes had dropped the slapstick shtick and done more cartoons like this, dry and surreal, they might have been able to survive into the 70s. Big Game Haunt. I don't know, what can I say about this? I mean, it's not funny and it looks cheap, just like all the other cartoons from this era. Although the ghost saying that nobody wants to be his friend because he's a spook is an interesting way to phrase that, especially when you consider the time period this was made in. Skyscraper Caper. There's something kind of oddly heartwarming about seeing Daffy and Speedy being on friendly terms. Although, for once, Speedy is kind of being unreasonable and making Daffy pay five pesos every single time he stops him from sleepwalking. Anyway, this is more cheaply made cartoon antics. Not completely unwatchable, but most definitely not good either. Hippie Drome Tiger. This is basically like the other Cool Cat cartoons. Yeah, do I really need to elaborate? I have sat through so many of these cheaply made, choppy cartoons by this point that I think I'm beginning to suffer the early effects of whatever the opposite of sensory overload is. Feud with a dude. Okay, I don't care if it was done to save money. I liked them including real life footage of a rocket launch. And plus the idea of Merlin accidentally bringing the Hatfields and McCoys together and having them both chase after him is a decent concept in and of itself. But once again, the cheapness of the animation prevents that halfway decent idea from actually getting off the ground. See you later, Gladiator. This is it, the final nail in the coffin for the classic era Looney Tunes. A poorly animated, poorly timed, dull mess that is not even marginally amusing and has no real reason to exist. To be honest, watching Looney Tunes degrade as far as they have has just been sad and depressing. But for a cartoon that has such a negative reputation... I wish I had more to say about it, but it really is just bad in many of the same ways that the other ones of this era are bad. In fact, I would go so far as to say this isn't even the worst Seven Arts animated cartoon. But yeah, make no mistake, that does not in any way make this good. And, with Daffy and Speedy now gone, that's it for the Looney Tunes characters considered part of their classic lineup. All that's left in the remaining ten cartoons are characters created specifically by Seven Arts. Three Ring Wing Ding. God, that is a horrendous title. Anyway, there's just nothing here. I wish I had more to say about these cool cat cartoons, but I just can't get a handle on his personality. He just seems like a stereotypical beatnik, and that's it. The writing in these cartoons is just not smart enough to compensate for its cheap animation. Flying Circus. You know what I just realized what these Seven Arts cartoons are like? These cartoons are basically what would happen if you gave a four-year-old with severe ADHD 17 energy drinks and then told him to make a cartoon. There is no sense of coherence, no sense of cohesion, the timing is hopelessly erratic, and it's loaded with tons of loud cartoony sound effects in a desperate attempt to make up for the stilted animation. For those that think See a Later Gladiator is the worst of the worst, I submit to you that this absolute train wreck is a far worthier contender. 
Chimpanzee. The final cartoon directed by Alex Lovey before Bob McKimson would return for the last seven cartoons. And, yeah, I have nothing to say about this one. It's the same kind of nonsense that we've seen up to this point. Not funny, completely off, and ugly. It's cartoons like this that really make me want to put Looney Tunes out of its misery already. Bunny and Claude, We Rob Carrot Patches. So, now that classic Looney Tunes director Mom McKimson is back in the director's chair... Can he possibly reinvigorate these series of cartoons? Well, the low-budget animation is still a problem, but I gotta admit, I like the idea of two bunnies acting out a parody of Bonnie and Clyde. This was clearly made by a man with good comedic instincts, but he can only do so much with what he's given. The Great Carrot Train Robbery This Bunny and Clyde cartoon greatly benefits from focusing on one single plot, In this case, following the two of them as they try to rob a train, rather than their previous outing, which just seemed more like a scattershot of ideas, kind of haphazardly thrown together. Kind of has the feel of a cheap, watchable enough Saturday morning J. Ward Productions cartoon. Fistic Mystic. This entire thing is like watching two snails trying to argue about politics. Way too much time spent on the setup, nowhere near enough time on the actual meat of the cartoon. And I hope I don't feel like a broken record when I say this, but the cheap animation kills any potential of the slapstick scenes from actually having the impact they need in order to be funny. Rabbit Stew and Rabbits 2. So, in a very desperate attempt at trying to recapture the Looney Tunes glory days, they decided to retry the Wile E. Coyote Roadrunner cartoon formula, only this time with a fox and the Nesquik bunny. But, yeah, a good formula is a good formula, and if anybody has the right to try to rip it off, it would be Warner Brothers. I mean, it's not great, heck, it's not even good, but this is far more watchable than honestly it has any right to be. And credit where it's due, this thinker gag was a good bit. Shamrock and Roll. You know, when the entire first third of your cartoon is devoted to just trying to figure out where exactly your cartoon is going to take place, maybe you need to accept that your cartoon's pacing is absolutely dreadful. Anyway, Merlin and Second Banana exit Looney Tunes with another absolutely dull dud. I started off thinking maybe their cartoons could have had potential, but they just didn't take advantage of any of it. Bugged by a Bug For once, it seems like Cool Cat's more beatnik persona is actually utilized here by putting him in a situation and location where his personality actually shines, rather than simply going through the typical Looney Tunes cartoon chase formula. And we actually get some good, solidly amusing reactions out of him as well. While still not funny, this is still above par compared to what Seven Arts was normally putting out. Especially under Alex Lovey's direction as opposed to Bob McKimson's. Engine Trouble. And, finally, we end on this cartoon. And, just so we're clear, this is the Engine Trouble made by Bob McKimson that was released in 1969, not the Engine Trouble that was released back in 1938 made by Bob Clampett. Honestly, it's really fitting that the final Looney Tunes cartoon made in the classic era had the exact same title from an older cartoon. It's almost kind of poetic in a really twisted kind of sense. But how is the actual cartoon in and of itself? Honestly, pretty bad. This feels less like a cartoon and more of a series of things happening on the screen with little to no cohesion and with overly cartoony sound effects overlaying the soundtrack to try to compensate when i say this feels like a bunch of unfunny family guy style cutaway gags strung together that's only a minor exaggeration and honestly that's not even getting into all the indian stereotype jokes which you know i kind of figured they would have died out by 1969 but i guess not the most surprising thing about this and honestly the only not terrible part of this is the topless saloon joke. I mean, sure, the punchline is very obvious, but honestly, just the idea that the words topless saloon are in a Looney Tunes cartoon, and the fact that Looney Tunes as a cartoon series closed out while inside said topless saloon is pretty funny in and of itself. And yeah, that's it. That is all 1,003 of the official Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies spread out over four entire decades from all the ups and all the downs. And in all seriousness, I am glad that I did this. Not only did I manage to discover some new cartoons that I had never even heard of that I think deserve more attention, 
but this is also the largest project I've ever undertaken, and I actually managed to finish it. And not only that, but finish it in about a year or so. And honestly, that would not have been possible without you guys. I'm not sure I would have finished this, or at least as quickly as I did, without the support, without the awesome comments, and all that. So, sincerely, sincerely, thank you guys. Anyway, first, let's take a look at the stats from this part and how they compare to the other nine. So, um, as you can see, there's been a downgrade, and most definitely not an insignificant one. This is about on par with part one in terms of quality. But I should say that these are bad in a much different way than many of those cartoons were bad. A lot of the ones during that time were mostly just dull, bland, and repetitive. And in some instances, the story structures were broken due to them not putting emphasis on story at all and experimenting a little bit more. Because animation was so new at the time, in my opinion, they get a little bit more leeway. And for all their faults, the animation back then was actually very rubbery and smooth and mostly decent. However, with most of the later cartoons in this part, the animation is very jerky and incredibly cheap. Again, the dip in quality isn't due to them not knowing what they were doing, but rather a weakness due to the limited budget that they were given due to the declining popularity of playing cartoon shorts before movies in theaters. And like I mentioned in my Norman Normal review, part of the issue might be that they didn't adapt enough to survive. Trying to maintain the same level of slapstick Looney Tunes were well known for with far less money and with a less talented crew was going to be a losing battle. They should have changed gears and gone with something more dialogue heavy, more surreal, more deadpan. Maybe then they could have survived, but for whatever reason, whether because of habit or just plain stubbornness, they weren't interested in doing so. And so as a result, the Looney Tunes of the classic era did not end on a high note. It ended with a whimper when it had been milked completely dry. But thankfully, this is not the end of these iconic characters. Sure, they disappeared for a while, but their more classic iterations still lived on in syndication, movies, and new television series, earning new fans every generation. And they're still popular even to this day, and still going strong, including a new series of Looney Tunes cartoons that are being made right now. But let's refocus back on the classic era for the time being. Here's the final spread of all the ratings of all the Looney Tunes cartoons. As you can see, the overwhelming majority of these were 6 out of 10s. So... At the very least, Looney Tunes was very capable, actually throughout almost all of its history, of creating a very solid product. And its number of genuine stinker cartoons is actually quite low, about 6% when all is said and done. And the number of great cartoons, which in my opinions are the 9s and the 10s, is at 20%. For a cartoon series as long-running, diverse, and experimental as Looney Tunes, that number is nothing to sneer at. That is a lot of greatness. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching me going through all these. I enjoyed doing this a great deal. But, it's not quite over yet. Now, before we get to the final ranking video, I do have a little bit of unfinished business to take care of. As is to be expected, considering I had to rush through some of these, and considering just how many of them there were, there are cartoons that, in my personal opinion, I'm not so sure that I gave a fair shake on my initial watch. There are some that I do want to give a second chance. Most of them are ones that I think maybe I was a little too harsh on at first. But then there are a couple that I think perhaps I was too generous with as well. As of right now, the number of cartoons that I want to give a second look at is 9, and they are as follows. Bosco the Lumberjack. You're too careless with your kisses. Ride Him Bosco. Buddy the Dentist. Pigs as Pigs. Little Red Walking Hood. Good Night Elmer. Kitty Cornered and the cat's bah. In addition to these, I also need to give a proper re-review of what was by a wide margin my biggest and most embarrassing mistake, and that was my review of the Daffy Duckaroo. But those are just the ones that I've come up with so far. And now I want to open the floor to you guys. Are there any cartoons that you think I was just completely off the mark on? It has been known to happen a time or two. So if you think there's one that you feel I should give a second chance, whether because I was too harsh on it or too generous on it, be sure to put it in the comment section below. Now, this isn't going to guarantee that I'm going to give it a second chance, but I will at the very least consider it, especially if it's one that keeps popping up in the comments. But yeah, as soon as that's done and I feel comfortable with my rankings, there will be one final video in which it's going to be the ranking of all 1,003 cartoons, starting with the worst of the worst, up to the best of the best. So stay tuned for that. And 
I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to be notified of when part 10.5 or the final ranking video come out, make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss them. Anyway, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.